Welcome everybody and uh, thanks for joining in to this week's edition of the Curious Coaches Club. Um, I'm sure you'll be uh, looking forward to another edition of, of some insight and some sharing from um, both myself uh, and Andy Bradshaw, who are here from UK Coaching, and from Jack Rolf from the Coaching Lab, and Darren Lamont, or Dads, as I probably get referred to, who's from Sales Sharks. Obviously, as you, uh, you've all logged on, you've seen that today we are exploring the topic of coaching using games. Um, and what we'll look to do is try and explore that through looking at it from three different areas uh, and then hopefully give you some tangible takeaways for us to look at at the end. First of all, um, what I'm going to do is start to uh, just get your, your minds thinking and uh, draw us into something. Uh, focusing around coaching and I've got three questions for each of our panelists just before I do that some housekeeping can we make sure that we mute mics that we keep our videos off to help with the bandwidth and ensuring that obviously um, the videos that are displayed work really well um, any chat or any questions or anything you're interested in make sure you use the chat box and have everything and have the send to turn to everyone and if you're tweeting about it or Instagramming about it or Facebooking about it, use the hashtag great coaching. That's just the housekeeping. Hopefully you've got a coffee or a tea or a drink and you're good to go for the next hour. But without further ado, three big questions for uh, both our panelists. Um, hi, Darren, are you there? Yeah, hi, mate. Hi, everyone. Brilliant. Managed to unmute. Excellent. And Jack, are you there? Yeah, all good, Mark. Brilliant. So Jack's joining us from Perth, Western Australia, one of the best places in the world. And uh, where are you joining us from, Daz? Uh, the mighty Cheshire. Exactly. Another great <laughs> thing. In the and we we'll just check that Andy's with us. Are you there, Andy? Yes, I'm clearly coming from the jungle of the nursery. So the giraffe, <laughs> uh, the sign of all good webinars at the moment is, uh, is behind me. Really looking forward to this afternoon. So, as I alluded to before, we'll have a quick quick delve into some, some in, uh, interesting questions. So, the first question for Jack and Dallas to ponder, um, what did you originally believe about coaching to be true, but you've now changed your mind about? Now, you've got one minute each. We'll start off with Jack. Off you go. Um, I think mine was uh, that tactics win games. Um, but actually, I think it's a lot more than that. I think it's there's obviously the people in front of you that win the games. Uh, there's the skill level that win the games, um, and not just the the tactics that you put on the day. And there's so much you you can't control. But I think that'd be one of my biggest things that I've learned. Um, I've been in a few situations where I've probably relied on tactics too much. And yeah, that would be mine, Mark. Well, hopefully we can unpick some of that and um, some of those thoughts later on. And uh, Daz, uh, it won't take a minute this one, pal. But um used to believe that the, the game was simply good enough, that the game was the best coach, when actually um, over the years and getting gears in the years of coaching in many environments, it's not the game, it's actually the coach and their qualities, their principles, that's the best coach. So a little bit of a, I thought just using a game was good enough, it's a bit of a cop out, it's actually the coach and who you're coaching with and your team that will drive performance. So that'll be mine, mate. Brilliant. Uh, second question to Jack. Uh, what's the best piece of advice that you've been given? Uh, to smile more, I think would be mine. Uh, yeah, to smile more than I normally do. Yeah. Like it. And Daz? Uh, yeah, I couldn't, couldn't, I've got three, so I'm just going to share them. I couldn't think of one. Um, the importance of getting to know your players. But um, I mean, really getting to know your players in the fact of the dual identity. Uh, the person first and then the performance will come in a coaching capacity and then um the biggest one i'd say is if you've got the skill set or the know how the people around you to learn how that how they learn how people learn especially your athletes um it'll take you coaching especially in a game contest to another level bro cool and um, my final one is uh and hopefully a lot of people will be able to take some of some of these away so what book would you recommend and why We'll start with uh, we'll start with Daz. 
Uh, the book's called The Courage to be Disliked. Uh, ah, here we go. I'm going to try and say the names now. It's by Ichiro Kashimi and Fumitaki Koga. The why um, is about how you kind of deal as a coach for the desire of recognition. I think that's a big barrier that you, all the work you do and you want to self-promote and all the recognition might not come your way within the coaching. It'll be about the player first and it's just a great book about how that don't worry about the recognition bit of your coaching. The rest will follow. Real good, real good book. Brilliant. Like it, my heard of that. Bro, and Jack? Uh, mine would be Barcelona away. Uh, literally just finished it. Uh, and for a dyslexic to finish it in two weeks, it must be a good book. So I thought it was awesome. Um, just the insightfulness of the influence that not just Pep has, but his behaviours as well. Uh, they speak about you know, cultural architects. So actually the legacy that he's left behind is, is probably more impactful because he brought good people with him that said the uh, that presented their behaviours in a way that everyone else could join in. So Barcelona away would be would be my one. Awesome, awesome. Thanks for that, guys. Uh, anything from you, Andy, on those? Any that you've read? I think what I'm going to try and do is refer to some as we go through. Um, so some of the links that we'll talk about. Hopefully, um, we can drop those in during the conversation and pop on connected coaches afterwards as well. And that's brilliant. Now, just a quick one. Yeah. Messages that are coming up about book recommendations from, from people. How are you going to collate that? Are you going to do it after? Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll deal with all, all that stuff. So, that, that, yeah, you just yeah. concentrate on, uh, on having the conversation with myself, Jack and, and Andy, and, and we'll deal with the text things. So, uh, just moving on to sort of the, the main focus for today, and that's us exploring how we want to coach using and coaching through uh, games. Um, what we'll do first of all, we'll see myself and Andy to start to look at what, what is some of the, the information out there, what are some of the, the things that, that people might be trying, exploring, uh, and almost just making, making us aware of, of what is out there. Our main aim really today is not necessarily to say one approach is best. What we're really looking to do is to um, Sort of provide some key takeaways which we'll do at the end but also to explore um, the key areas where you might want to focus some of your attention as a coach um, specifically looking at environment looking at the players the performers the athletes you're working with and looking at yourself as a coach and behaviors that you you might need to to um, show in your coaching do you want to just kick start us off, Andy, with, with, with sort of the first thing to, for us to really think about from a, a coaching through games perspective? Yeah, I think so myself and um, a Mark in discussion to this, I mean, there are obviously a number of different um, uh, coaching approaches that you may well have heard about in terms of using games. So they would uh, you know, possibly date back to um, teaching games for understanding, uh, so Bunker and Thorpe's seminal work in the early 80s. Um, you may well have heard of um, more recently Amy Price's work around uh, digital video games approach to coaching. Um, in between those, work around game sense, constraints about approach to coaching. Um, so there is you know, a plethora of uh, different options there. And one of the things that we were try, quite keen to find, so we're trying to use this as a bit of a, um, a as a metaphor or as sort of a guiding principle for where we're going to go today is is exploring it as a bit of a journey. Um, so it, trying to uncover what are the practical implications in trying to understand why you might use a particular approach. So really digging into the why. Um, so that obviously requires an understanding of those different approaches but we could spend you know a, a whole hour exploring each one of those so there's definitely a <laughs> curiosity in terms of some of the links that we'll share on connected coaches if you want to find out a bit more on on amy's work around so amy price's work around digital video game approach well that's something that we can signpost you to and you can really start to dig into that detail um, if you wanted to explore how the slightly different work, you know, work around gamification, so how you might use um, rewards in and out of coaching. So you might look at gamification in a work context, how you might look to um, drive motivation and um, engagement within learning through a rewards-based process. So again, it's something that you might want to have a look at. What does that mean? 
so we can signpost you towards some of that work. Um, and almost talk to you, what does that mean? What does that mean for us as coaches? Um, so what are the things that we have to consider in terms of possibly challenging some of the things that we might have done? Maybe some of the bits that we've had through coach education or through sort of, um, traditional working models actually start to have a look at, well, what does this mean for me as a coach? Certainly, what does it mean for the people that we're working with? So looking at learning and them as learners, um, how can we really start to unpick um, what are we wanting to see? Um, so genuinely, uh, you know, if someone was coming to watch a session um, and see the learners in action, what are the types of things might you be seeing in terms of them solving problems, being creative, experimenting, failing, trying things? What does that actually look like in practice? And then the environment, how do we, how do we create environments that are um, really supportive, start to build autonomy, um, start to get players engaged, very much engaged in their own learning? So that's what we're going to try and cover and sort of unpick with Jack and Daz, myself and Mark will try and help them navigate how well, they've probably gone through that process of working it through in their own coaching. And I think I think it's also important to to make that differentiation between we're not just here to to look at coaching from a an invasion games point of view, for example, as 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 a lot of potentially the the research or the the resources out there will say a lot of the approaches uh, and the principle based approach that we're going to take hopefully take you guys on will be applicable whether it's uh whether you're delivering a cycling session whether you're delivering a tennis session there are ways in which you can apply these principles that can really draw out them ultimately the experience and the learning for for the people that you're working with and I do think, I mean, one of the underpinning or under, definitely one of the underpinning things here, games are fun. Um, so one of the things, you know, in terms of linking back to Jack's point about smiling more, you know, what should we be seeing in terms of, you know, our, our participants engaging in really great coaching is it's enjoyable. There still may be elements of challenge and um, pleasant frustration is a, is a, uh, a phrase that's come up in a couple of other webinars this week. People stretching and stretching challenging um, but actually one of the reasons why we're trying to build people's desire to engage in, in real um, uh, great coaching using uh, games principles is that it is enjoyable there's almost like a seduction around it actually really starting to get involved in the learning process to move ourselves on and it's it's not us as the coach um, directing that it's the uh, it's the players, our participants, being really involved in that learning. Cool. So what I want to do is try and see um, what some of the experiences that both Daz and Jack have had. And the first area I really want us to think about is what should our learners, so what should the people we're coaching, be doing if they're in really successful, fun learning environments uh, through through the use of games. I think Daz, just really be keen to know what your opinion is and, and, and how you've gone about using a games based approach, but through the lens of the learner and what they're doing. Yeah. Um, just to kick things off a little bit, um, there's kind of some principles around the game design that I kind of stick to. It's not, I don't know if it's a philosophy or, or what, but I'll share them and then I'll, I'll explain why later on. So it's, it's simplicity is key in this game design. Um, you have to kind of stay close to the game. Uh, teach your players to excel in 1v1 scenarios and small overload situations um, to make the game make sense and ultimately to love the game for life. So that's kind of what guides my, my design. And that might, might come across in some of the things I'll be saying. Um, my experience, what the kind of learners should be looking at, they should be kind of good and bad errors. We kind of use quite a lot in our, within our academy. Um, Highlighting the good, good errors, the bad errors, just to elaborate on that. Um, trying stuff, I think, is the easy kind of phrase. We would want them to be, we talk a lot about what the future game of, of rugby in our context would look like. Um, it definitely should be looking like that. Um, players taking major ownership, that would be something around that environment. Are they, are they prompting each other? Are they becoming player coaches? That is where I think is going with athletes is they are just going to be part and extended of the coaching team. Um, problem solving, 
like Brad has said, and not was not solving the problem for him. Um, I think are they demonstrating what what we collectively kind of said success will look like? So at the start of each session or game design or if you're academy school where it has kind of a template of success, whether that's skills or development stages, is that evident right in front of you? So I can elaborate a little bit more on that later on, but that'll be probably something in my my head, hopefully across all sports. Cool. Thanks, that. And uh, what about in your head, Jack? What are you thinking? What what should the learners be looking to to do or to perform or to show? I think it's very similar to, to Dad's. I think ultimately we're in an entertainment industry. I think sport is entertainment. So our kids should be showing us stuff. They should be allowed and should be free to, to entertain. Uh, so be one, that freedom to, to execute skills. I think communicating between each other would be a big one. Um, there's only one coach, but actually, or, or more than one coach, but you've got 11 coach, you've got 11 people on the pitch and, and a few subs, depending on the sport that you play. So I think definitely some communication between there. Um, making decisions in the game would be one massive one. Um, I believe the game's king. The game will always be king. Um, so the, making the decisions in the game, communicating with each other, adapting as well, recognising what the future trends might be, what are they recognising from their opposition, what are they recognising from their own teammates that will then support them to go on in the future. Cool. And, and just, just picking up on a couple of things, really, what, what does adapting look like from a within the game. So what might you expect them to be doing if they are, if they are adapting within a game and, and how might that sort of be set up? How might you set up some of those scenarios so you can draw that out of the, out of the performers, out of the athletes? I suppose one would be uh, not the coach to always give the answer would be one. I don't think they'd always adapt if we, if the coach gave them the answer because there's nothing to adapt to. Um, I think the game has to ask them to adapt. So yeah, there might be a different challenge for the opposition. There might be uh, a different number on the opposition in terms of it might be 7v5. So there's a question that, that's asking them to adapt would be one. Um, and Daz, I don't know about your stuff, but I think it would definitely be around. Yeah. around. Um, doing the obvious. Obvious is good. You know, if you kind of, you want them to adapt and you've got it in your mind and you're working together and they're doing the obvious adaptations in it. So that's what we'd want to see. Uh, what gets repeated gets well. Let's say let's. What's it's about rewarding. So whatever you reward will get repeated. So make sure as coaches in that game sense we're rewarding, rewarding the stuff that's got to that situation you want to see again. So say um, they haven't quite executed something on the pitch. Are you rewarding the process that allowed to get up to that, and then they'll probably overtake and and, and excel with it and and, and execute it. That'll be something on my mind. I suppose, Mark, something else on that would be some players don't realise they've adapted. So I think it's actually about the coach recognising what they have adapted and whether that's a small conversation after or on video or coached on the run or whatever, but actually recognising what that adaption moment was because some kids will just do it naturally. Um, but it's about recognising what they've done really, really well to adapt. Yeah, it's quite interesting. And a lot of this has not necessarily been um, the, the coach directly interjecting and, and, and telling someone what to do. So again, one of the key philosophies of using any form of real um, approach using games is actually that the game allows allows the allows the, the, the specific habits or particularly one being a being adaption allows that to come out. So how you might design your your game or your practice, so it may have game like um, elements to it, but allows that to, to come out. Anything from you, Andy, just to, to further some of those thoughts? Yeah, I mean, just an example of, um, so what, one of the principles that comes out of some of Amy's work is around actually players or participants in a game situation knowing what information they might need and mm -hmm. also knowing where to find it or how to find it. So uh, quite a nice little example of that is just the question of, am I quicker than my opponent? So in a 1v1 situation, you know, that's crucial information to have. But some players, you know, you might not know it was, you might not know that going into a game. Um, you might not know it in a training session either. Um, but creating a situation and possibly manipulating maybe the size of the pitch, so making it a longer pitch, so the space in behind defenders for the players to explore that. Um, 
and it might be just something around actually that's information that you need to gather um and the decision making for the players in terms of being good learners is just well let's try and um find that out early in a game so how do you find that out you put the ball in behind the defender and let's see who's quicker actually that gives us information to use um but it's players finding that information and that's the bit around becoming better learners within the game is we're trying to create situations that are helping our players learn within the game so i think Baz and and jack have already mentioned that it's the in-game choices and decisions or the inactivity that we're looking to try and um, set up. Um, so it's that, it's definitely that coach mindset of trying to get across, well, what problems are we trying to solve today? Not here are the solutions for you. It's actually these are the things <clears throat> we want to try and explore. Um, and we're not going to get them right straight away, but we're going to give space and time to, for you to explore them as individuals. I think it's just been a, a nice little question popped into the chat, which uh, we can um, not go into too much detail because that's not necessarily where I want to go. But they've said, um, I think it's Kai has just asked what other approaches other than game sense and TGFU. So just just to answer that question, and it, and it relates probably quite nicely to some of this is there are there are loads of different nuances on on using games. There's the video uh, video games based approach, and there's gamification. So. Gamification might look at purely using reward, and, and as Andy alluded to earlier, that that is something which it can be used in in any facet of life. You know, it might be used within a corporate context around actually leaderboards and actually getting people to to see the reward of getting to the top. A, a video games based approach taps into sort of metacognition and ability to think and learn about what you're doing, and explores different types of coaching craft around being able to get to the next level and, and accessing accessing your way through the game like that. And again, I think Nick alluded to something, it's about the when and the why, not necessarily just a load of things. It's actually where might you use these specific interventions. And again, if we link it back to the, the first principle we're looking at is what are you looking to see and observe from your performers and let that guide where you want to go from a session design and, and what approach you might pick. And Mark, I think just picking up on that, I think it's good feedback when you watch a game what do you want to see most in the session or in that game it's probably good feedback to the coach if you're not seeing what you want to see necessarily you probably do need to mix it up and, and change the variations cool. have you got have you got any players or any performers that you, you think might be really good exponents of um of some of the things you've talked about i'm thinking you know really adaptable players or a really excellent decision makers and what what some of the the habits or some of the things they will do any anything that comes to mind from that point uh an expectation of the game so to work with it with you on the game as well so some of the better players will help support you to cope with that game sensitivity you'll find the simple question of look we've got this game it's either a planned or reactive so it's either planned that we've got these tactical things we want to work on or it's reactive to a game from the weekend or, or whatever your context is. They will naturally draw to you by you simply going, look, we need to get here. I'm looking for some support around this game design from player's perspective. You will get two or three players. If your environment's right, that will come and support that anyway. So that's probably, that's not actually in the moment playing. That's actually some of the off-field stuff around coaching as well. Um, like dominoes, once one start, two start, Players start coming in, they start supporting your game design, what they want to see, what constraints, how they think you should be better. They will recommend stuff to players as well on it. And then you've created um, loads of leadership opportunities. And your game design's really good because they've got the ownership on it. So a little bit on that about some of the top players and what they've done in my experience. Cool. Yeah, I think there's one from from mine. Uh, I think one characteristic was kind of almost calmness in the chaos. I think probably one of the most adaptive young girls I've seen in, in hockey was probably one of the most quietest girls um, but just the ability to survey the area and work out what was going on and it's not always the loud people that are necessarily going to make those decisions or change the game it's probably going to be those people that are just surveying the area and checking out what's going on and who's got the most information. Cool uh, just want to try and just flip our thinking a little bit now I'm starting to think about more of the how so how are we creating these environments that allow some of these skills to start to um, show? 
uh, and, and appear. Um, yeah, what, what are some of the things you guys do in terms of creating environments? What do you do to enable this to happen? I have, I have three things. Uh, decisions, intensity and meaning would be kind of three, like what fuels to the fuel in the game would be three things I'd always look for to, to add in. So there's intensity, there's decisions and there's meaning would be, would be free. And I also think the game is important if we're always just playing the same type of game on a weekend. And Daz, I don't know what it's like in rugby with Dale, yeah. but particularly some of the football in academies for the invite for the criticism they get, they do an amazing job at <clears throat> delivering a good games program. So they're not always playing the same format and they're playing different numbers, different styles of the game, which is asking different questions of the players. Yeah, there's, um, there's a couple of principles we kind of use. Um, it's really important everyone collectively knows what they're kind of aiming for. Yes, you'll have your session objectives, but what's kind of the bigger picture? So in our kind of academy coaching around the 13, 14, 15, 16 ages, I don't know if anyone can, can relate, it probably will to, to other ages as well. What is the big kind of draw aim? And that'll guide everything through session design. We kind of, kind of stick to three kind of core principles of the game sense, the core skill and the athleticism. So they're the kind of three that will drive our design, uh, making sure we're stuck close to the game. There's skill development in there. And in a rugby context, there has to be some athletic development within a game. That's probably one of the, the hidden benefits of the time constraint we have with these athletes at that time is literally an hour to an hour to 15. We can't take it all off. So that's some stuff that will kind of drive us. A big thing would be how we work with co-coaches as well. I think that is a major part in kind of not just designing your, your, the game itself or what's going into it, but you work with your coaches, how you co-coach. Um, that's probably the, the top three or four, really, about how we go into it. Yeah, there's some good stuff coming in on the on the um, on the chat. So uh, some people are mentioning um, sort of co-pilots of the athlete journey as opposed to the coach that leads it. So actually, again, linking back to um, giving them autonomy of, of games of, of of the coaching. Uh, and again, linking into, I think, Rob's thought, getting players to take part of the session or, or co-create, co-design part of the session. And again, I think it leads us back into our sort of North Star of, well, what are we looking to try and do? Or what do we want the players or the, or the athletes to be able to do? And then how do we design the game and the environment to enable that to happen? And again, there's no point in, in wanting um, people, your coach, to be autonomous if you don't give them the opportunity to... Uh, to be empowered and to make make decisions around what the session or what the what the game might look like, and again that's where some of the things such as um, being able to press pause, being able to say the game if you're applying a video games based approach, <coughs> a really useful little um, little bits of coaching craft that you can apply, uh, and again it allows them to to take their time to do that. Anything from you, Andy? Yeah, the Sean. Jack, you go um, I don't think we're saying do a different game every single session. I think it's, it's quite good to have a almost a core group of games that you would do, which offers good feedback to the players. And as coaches, I'm not saying, right, every single session you have to do a different type of game. Um, but as long as, you know, Daz said at the start, just stay close to what mm -hmm. the game is asking you um, and just have variations on that. Yeah, so my, my point was around building on, so we've used the word autonomy and we might um, certainly one thing to link back into would be self-determination theory in terms of why we might do some of these things in terms of building a motivation engagement. But one thing, another area to have a look at would be almost player or performer agency. So agency would be you know, the idea we can have any type of influence or control over what happens to us. Now, that would be a classic one. Sometimes um, our our participants come through either a, a school system where just they don't really have a control. You know, they turn up to a lesson, they get told what to do, they get set home where they do that. And yet they what we'd like them to be able to do is turn up to a coaching session and they are much more involved in their own learning, um, possibly in the design of what's happening, developing it might be about the pace of how things move on rather than it just being the coach that is dictating all of that 
um, which is, you know, picking up on one of the points in the chat, it can be a little bit scary for coaches. There is a loss of control. We're giving control over to the players or an element of control over to the, our participants. And for a coach, that can be quite scary. You don't know where it's going to go, but in the same way, you don't know what's going to happen in a game. Our positions will do different things. Players have to be able to adapt. And, and that's one of our participants. If you're going down a river as a canoeist, you know, there you might well have looked at the river, but how the water moves will change and you need to be able to adapt and overcome and be flexible. So that's, that, I think, some of those key things around what do our environment looks like? Uh, what, look like it, it should be enable enabling players to experiment and adapt and the coach's behavior in that is crucial yeah i think and i think probably that leads us nicely into to the topic of the behavior of the coach and and, and there's a there's a number of things ultimately from that the coach is is linked to that the coach will set that environment um yes they'll also I suppose have an idea of what the end in mind looks like so what might they want the players to to end up um becoming or, or how they might like them to perform but ultimately their behaviors will be the things that really supports and allows allows that process to flourish and happen i'm just really interested to know from a from a coach behavior point of view jack and and does what what are some of the things which both yourselves do um great coaches that you've worked with or observed uh yeah and how can you go about setting your behaviors to be really aligned with what you're trying to do uh i'll kick us off if you want jack for a bit um good question good question mark yeah it's pretty uh well better just then like it's a bit scary players taking over the game it's a bit scary for coaches to actually be honest with their how they behave and stuff so it's a great question um Something over the last year or two, for me as a coach, is not much stuff or off the grass or off the track ways. I'm a, I'm a reflecting properly. Pretty tough to do as a coach. I'm a, I'm a doing the practice designs real justice for watching, I don't know if practice, but watching previous training sessions and our environment, we're quite lucky to get, to get recordings done. I'm a digging deeper with the questions. I'm a bringing people on board with me. Um, that would be so, so so heavily the stuff I do off grass is now influencing some of the stuff I do on the grass. So that would be something I'd be recommending to coaches. Wise, I'd be gutted if people weren't saying I'm an encourager, I'm an energizer, um, works hard and showing a little bit of vulnerability and actually it's all right not knowing. I haven't got that capacity uh, or I don't know enough on that, but I'll go and find out for you. Little things like behaviors around that so it's okay not to know but I'll, as long as the players know we're in a constant learning development environment together then they will show vulnerability on the when it comes to trying things adaptations and stuff like that so that's from me i suppose uh one thing i've always been a bit conscious of is is where i stand if you always stand in the same position you're probably always going to nag the same players or speak to the same players um and ultimately you want to see and feel what the game is probably asking of the players um and if you go to holland for hockey that you know the hockey capital you'd see people just standing you know they'd create a game and the coach would be in the middle straight away so the coach can scan 360 um he can speak with different players or she speak with different players probably got more than one ball in hand so can throw them in different areas um but they're not just standing in the same position i almost think of it as a like a gps map and you see the players of a heat map, but actually what's the coach's heat map after a session? Is it always standing in the same position or how many players are you connecting with? Yeah, I think that's quite interesting around being being intentional with, with what you do from a coaching point of view. So I think one of the good things for me will be around your planning of a lot of these things. Um, are, are we are we thinking through how the, how the game might uh, evolve? Are we actually um, starting to think about whether we're looking to reward, whether we're looking to develop our motivation within within the athletes, um, what, particularly the where you might provide feedback or how they might source feedback. So, for example, if we're if we're looking to develop players that are um, constantly looking to be adaptable or constantly looking to to make decisions, 
are we actually how might we provide the feedback or help them get the feedback to support that as opposed to just doing something more more traditional mm -hmm. so i think that that's yeah really really interesting point um anything from you on that andy yeah i i look at um the types of questions that you as a coach might be asking of your participants whilst they're playing so if you delve into constraints that approach you know the perception action bit around that actually what you would be asking of players possibly is um what did you see there so yeah, what well. see there uh with a follow-up question which informed you to make that decision so you're not necessarily questioning the decision what you're starting to question or what where are you looking so actually you know you might be digging into or you've missed some bits of information because you're looking in the wrong places or you're not looking uh, with a wide enough perspective you're just focused on the ball or you're just focused on your your intended receiver but how you frame those questions to help players understand how they're making their decisions it links to one of the um one of the questions in the chat box around um decision making players you know might you ask a player to describe what their decision making process might be I mean, that could be really interesting. With I saw this and that was linked to that and I saw some space there. So that's why I did this. Um, so that is then showing what the process of the decision making process is for them. Um, obviously, you might have to be careful in terms of who you decide to ask on those things. But you, the questions you start to ask players, that then start to become your role as the coach to aid learning within the session. So absolutely concur with all the stuff around planning. You know, I probably, from a hockey coaching point of view, I find this really, uh, really challenging. You know, actually, you spend probably far more time thinking about exactly what are the problems that I want to solve or I want to try and explore. Sorry, I want the players to solve. But how am I going to design practices that are going to enable them to solve something <clears> rather than, you know, pro possibly going back to yeah. where I was 20 years ago coaching that I'd have been the one solving it for them? Um, and that actually is, it's a, it's a time consuming and interesting and um, really, um, uh, I think, really creative way about making, making games that are uh, interesting, fun, interactive, that actually are linked to some of the principles that you're looking to explore. Yeah, uh, and I think the thing for me is there's been a couple of good questions around how do you how do you encourage athletes to ask questions well again i think that links into the design of the design of what you're doing ultimately they need to be doing practices that require them to to make decisions in the first place so as i said it it looks like the game or looks like the sport that you're playing will ultimately start to conjure up a lot more decisions and if you were you know traditionally doing more block practice now i'm not saying there's not a time and a place for that but as we're discussing this um the coach enabling um, the decisions to be made through through decent practice design and ultimately their behaviours, i.e. they're probably um, asking more questions, setting more problems, will allow for them to start to, to make these decisions and ultimately then have something to, to reflect upon. And then it's the key of how do you ask the question uh, appropriately um, to actually get them to start to think about what they're doing to then to then start to mm -hmm. give you some information. I do think the behavior of the coach is one of the limiters on sort of creativity and experimentation. You know, if, even if it's just in your body language, you know, someone makes a mistake and, you know, you're either totting them. It was one thing that I, I came out of when I got um, video recorded. So I, I was filmed by a coach developer and uh, watching a player. And I, I noticed myself sort of tutting and sort of shaking my head almost involuntary when players are sort of making some mistakes it's like they will be you know, <clears throat> picked up by players um even if it's just not quite conscious so it's just being really aware of all of the things in terms of you as a coach if you're wanting to encourage players to explore and be creative then that will be reflected on your, your language the questions you ask <clears throat> how you ask the questions the language you use your body language all of those different things that then creates a really supportive environment which players will start to grow into i think half time is a prime example if uh, if the coach goes into half time and 
starts talking straight away and for five, ten minutes, it doesn't leave any time for any players to ask any questions. Um, but if the players are the first ones to speak and the <laughs> coaches having two minutes to get their reflections together, the players are probably going to have some conversations before you've even started as well. Yeah, there's some good stuff popping up in the chat box and from our, our listeners and observers. So think pair shares, quite a good one that's come from education. I know when I was a teacher, I, I, I used that. Uh, your point around around huddles and, and what, what does that look like? Obviously, huddles and, and feedback generally is like an adult construct. We think that's how they should do it. Actually, asking asking the people that are coaching or providing opportunities within the game to do that. So, for example, some of the players or, or the teams might have uh, timeouts or pauses that they're, they're able to play and then they might be able to be invited to then go and ask questions of a coach. So you might have one question at a time. So what you're starting to get is they're starting to encourage the, the players or, or the athletes to be thinking about what might be the most pertinent question that I might ask. Um, because actually, if I've only got one, one question per quarter or per half or, uh, or per effort on a bike, what might that question be that I ask? So they're starting to get some higher order sorting and thinking as well. And again, it's just starting to get them to really uh, drill down in their own so the thinking process, what, what is most important to me? What do I want information on? Yeah. Um, Mark, just on some of that, some ideas that people might relate to is, um, unfortunately, before all coaching has stopped over five, six, seven weeks ago, what it was, just working on um, hat tricks. So in most sports, you get, you get your hat tricks, don't you? you get, you're in the moment, kind of three goals or three something. We challenged our players for in the moment hat tricks, but it wasn't the outcome of a try or a goal. You had to get a hat trick on the go of questioning a coach. We had to hear you peer on peer questioning. You had to get a hat trick. It released your bonus points coming back to like the boat, you know, gamification stuff. You needed to be a bit of a rebel. You needed to be a, a rebel for the opposite team. You needed to, you were allowed a hat trick of rebel activity against the attack or defense. Uh, got a long way to go with it, but it just started getting the players to question each other, question the coach. Uh, you had to get a hat trick on how you changed this game in the moment. We couldn't stop the action. Just a little something that might trigger some thinking, but just for in the moment stuff as well, because a lot of that conversation before was how we'd, we'd have to stop the activity of the game and then have a talk about through questioning. And like you said, it's a bit, you can get a bit chalk and cheese and a bit drawn out if the answers are long, but I try experimenting with hat trick in the moment. Mm. Cool. Um, and again, I think just just building on some of those points, it, it definitely draws back into our our approach to planning and how we allow those opportunities and plan for those opportunities to happen. And, and again, you, using that game sense approach provides us with natural opportunities where you might plan in um, breaks or you might plan in endings of different games or activities and, and how you might go on to the next one that really cater for for those or really allow those opportunities to happen. Um, but I think what I'm hearing from both yourself and Jack is, is get creative with thinking of ways to get um, athletes, players to take on the ownership of, of asking the questions, but giving them the stimulus through the environment you set to make that happen. Um, so they have to be engaging and, and almost the games or, or the practices have to talk to the athletes and provide, provide them with some of that information. If that's priming a kid the question to ask at a younger age group, just so they have the confidence and the ability to know what question to ask, but you've primed them to, to create that opportunity for them. Cool. Cool. So what I want to do is just um, move on to, to trying to draw, draw some of our thinking into some takeaways for our listeners. Um, and, and starting to think about what, what are some of the key topics that uh, you guys have thought of. Um, so first of all, um, moving on to, to some of our, what does it mean for me as a coach? Well, actually it means I need to start to think about what I'm doing, what I'm planning. Um, if we think about um, getting them to think about their thinking, mm -hmm. Just trying to get our slides moving, Paul. If we start to think about, there we go, enabling player autonomy. So actually 
how are we through through our design starting to enable the player autonomy to come out? Are we setting problems or are we solving problems? So we want to be, if we're using a games-based approach effectively, starting to really set problems for them. And we want to be through that, we want to be increasing choices and decisions for them to make. So it's difficult to um, start to, to think about what you're doing if you're not having to think. Um, encouraging ex experimentation and adaption. So actually start to champion some of these things as, as skills or as things that we want to see within our sessions from the people that we're coaching. And ultimately what, what that comes down to is excellent planning. Anything from anything further from you, Andy, around sort of key points, takeaways? Yeah, so I mean the, the problem setting, not solving bit, I quite liked. So some of the um the reading on Amy's was around um the problem solving bit is thinking like a player. So, you know, how do I uh, in my map shop, how do I go in to do things differently than they're gonna pose um, different challenges to my opponent? The coach is the problem setter is possibly thinking like a game designer and using um, some of the, the tools and techniques that we've maybe mentioned today. So is it about um, creating a mission uh, for, your, um, for your players or participants to engage with? Um, is it about outwitting your opponents? How are you gonna, how are you gonna design that? So it's sort of two different, um, uh, two different ways of looking at things. Um, and definitely the, the problem solving bit is for the players to do um so it's just a sort of real definition of roles there um and you know linking back to some of the things that we talked about the the words that we've used on this summary side so enabling and encouraging i think those are really really important just to um to appreciate what the coach does around you know, enabling players to to, to to have more autonomy in what they're doing to have more agency a sense of agency encouraging experimentation is going to be a lot about your behavior you know how the, the the language that you use the way that you present yourself uh, the way that you, uh, you the way that you encourage um so that all players not just the ones that are confident that they they feel you know you're designing and creating that environment that all players feel able to ask questions and try things and fail um, and move at their own pace. So I think they're really important bits just uh, to think about it from a summary point of view. Yeah, and your point exactly. Planning is crucial in this. It doesn't happen overnight. Yeah, I think just a, a good question coming from Anita. She's put, sorry for the deaf question, what do you mean by enabling player autonomy? Essentially, what we want is players to be able to take ownership of of elements of sessions, sessions of the, of the decisions they make. So how will your design of your game allow them, apologies if you can hear shouting, that's my son, um, will allow them to start to think about taking control of, of the actions that they do within the game, how they run elements of the games or the practices, really, really giving them the empowerment to do that. Cool. Uh, if we just flip on to what I want to think about now is is uh, uh, quick questions to Jack and Darren. Is what is the one thing that you've learned from taking part in this? This is a, a campaign that we're running um, as a as a UK coaching organisation, trying to draw people to start to reflect on what they what they are taking away from all the stuff that is out there at the moment in the ether that is the internet, from the CPD point of view. So I'd be really keen to to speak to Darren and Jack and say, well, what, what have you guys learned either on this or over the last couple of weeks that's really <laughs> going to influence your coaching? Um, I'll go, I think, go, on, go on, Jack. Sorry. I can't quote the person, uh, but it's, they said connection before correction. So you connect with your environment, you connect with your, your players and your people before you go and correct them. Um, I think that psych social stuff's been a common thread of, across a lot of the content that's been put out there about knowing the individuals and knowing the people in front of you. Um, and I think if we talk to our players more, we're probably going to get better feedback um, because we know what they're going to, what they're feeling, what they're seeing. Um, and kids are, and players can be honest if the coach is vulnerable and honest around them. Cool. Like it. Uh, and again, yeah. I think that, sorry, I think that lends itself to 
lends itself to um, a lot of the stuff that we've talked about today, particularly around environment. So making sure you're connecting with your players, then feeling comfortable to be able to make some of these decisions and to make errors and then start to provide stimulus for them to, to think about what they might do next and an opportunity to improve. Is how I'm gonna how I'm gonna tell the players what I've been up to and all these webinars and stuff like that and how what we're doing. That's gonna be tough. But the biggest one would be um, <clears throat> I don't know if I'm looking over my shoulder enough really, and who's kind of coming with us on this journey. Me personally and, and coaches who we work with. So uh, crossroads really. So who's behind us? Who we bringing with us? Well, this is what we're sharing. I wish I'd known some of this stuff yesterday, which is great. What's the future? What's the you know, the path we're on, what we're aiming for, and then right and left, who's kind of with me now, I probably need to, to have a look at who, what's in front, what's coming behind us There's now, right and left to kind of drive it forward, really. So maybe a couple of things, more than one thing I've learned in there for you, Bates. Cool, brilliant, thank you. And then uh, just, just chuck the ball to Andy. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we've been having conversations as groups of coach developers as well over the last few weeks. And uh, one thing that came through that is um, looking in terms of all of the learning that's on offer at the minute, you could spend pretty much every hour, every waking hour of the day on a different webinar, but trying to search out things that are possibly um, at the edges of where your comfort might be or where your interest might be. So seeking out some things that might be from a different viewpoint um so and then thinking properly thinking about what does this mean for me um so i think it's you know it's easy just to go on webinars that sort of appeal to your biases um so maybe uh, find some learning that is um a little different to what you might normally expect and then reflect on that um, and see what it means to you brilliant cool <clears throat> Thanks. Um, the really, yeah, really valid points from all. I think particularly some of the things we've talked about today have got different things that sit beneath them, different pieces of learning, different bits of evidence, which I think what you could start to do um, is start to really layer, layer beneath some of the, the, these sort of things we've talked about. So, for example, Thomas has put stuff around self-determination theory and really how it explores giving autonomy over to, to different people. So I think that, again, that might be something which you might want to take away as well. Um, just some other offerings that we've got from UK Coaching. It's obviously quite a difficult time in terms of everyone getting out and about doing stuff. So we've got, we're looking to try and help support everyone in the coaching world uh, to, to get on, to support, to really take and make good use of the time that we've got. So we've got four areas to think about. We've got some e-learning courses. Uh, we've got online classrooms. Um, we will have face-to-face -face workshops and we've got our live webinar, what live webinars. You can access all of these through www.ukcoaching.org forward slash courses. We also then have our next Curious Coaches Club, which takes place on the 11th of May. And that topic is skill acquisition and that will be led by Marianne Davis, one of our senior coach developers at UK Coaching, as well as special guest of Stuart Armstrong, um, who is from the Talent Equation podcast, also works for Sport England and is a, is a hockey coach. And Kendall McQuaid, who is a founder of the Instinctive Golf Coaching Company, and he's a lead coach for the Scottish Junior Golf Tour. And again, they'll provide you with some really interesting and takeaway messages around how you can support skill acquisition and some basic principles for applying to your practice. And that'd be a real, I think it'd be a really interesting session for you all to log into. We also have some other webinars coming up. And the next one from our Time to Learn series will be building your coaching philosophy. And again, I think it's a really great time to start to, to think about what is your philosophy? How can you get the, the most out of yourself? And what does that mean for your philosophy? And Tom, one of our senior coach developers, will be taking you through that journey. Um, and again, really important and really good session. Make sure you get yourself hooked on for that. And lastly, um, if you can engage with our social media platforms, particularly our Twitter handle, the, we're, what we're looking to do is really generate insight to enable us to better support you as coaches over the course of the next few months. 
uh, and obviously moving further out. Um, and again, we've got running our daily polls, which would be really useful for you to engage with and start to help generate some of the, the content and, and what we're looking to support you with as coaches over the course of the next few months. And lastly, um, you're able to get a, a bonus from coming on the webinars, particularly our, our Curious Coaches Club. If you need to, um, or if you want to get yourself a certificate that just give, provides you with some um, proof of, of learning, uh, then you can do that if you follow the on-screen information. And it will also help generate some feedback for us as um, a Curious Coaches Club team. So yeah, if you just follow the simple three steps. And lastly, we've got our communities of practice, which are smaller groups of, of learning, uh, pockets of learning, led by our senior coach developers, who have mentioned Marianne and Tom already. And if you can log on, if you can log on to the ukcoaching.org website, and you can follow the links through and that'll enable you to log on to the communities of practice and register for those as well. I think um, just want to finally say thanks to our guests again, Daz uh, from Sales Sharks and Jack from the Coaching Lab, um, particularly Jack who's who's keeping up, <laughs> staying up late to uh, to come on and support your your learning. So nice. uh, massive thank you to you guys for engaging in the chat box. I thought there's some really really positive things mentioned on there and really insightful knowledge from, from our, our listeners. And again, it's always important that you guys are on. So thank you very much. Stay safe and uh, hopefully we'll see you next Monday. Cheers. See you, mate. Cheers.